one of the great things about the Zulus was we started the film and we had the most unseasonable weather that ever, ever was. It was snowing ice balls. The sky never lifted. And it's supposed to, it's a continuous action, the film. So it had blue skies the whole time. And the days went on, and we got to the sixth day, the seventh day. No work had been done. The camera hadn't turned at all. And the Zulus decided to send the witch doctor in to see if he could lift the weather for the unit. So this guy came and I took the children and he had all these feathers and his bones coming out of his nose and everything and he had these bones in a bag and he laid them on the, on the floor of the, of the, of the unit where, where, where um, the set was being built. And then he had chalk marks and he put extraordinary chalk marks. We were absolutely terrified. We never touched them all the way through the filming. We thought it would bring us bad luck. Nothing happened. The weather continued to be very bad. And on the 12th day, Stanley was in despair. We were over two weeks behind and nothing, not one shot had been done. So I got up at 4.30 in the morning and I mean, it was hallelujah. <laughs> The sky, the dawn was wonderful. I rushed, I said to Sandy, get up, get up, darling. I rushed to Cy Enfield, barged into their bedroom, get up, Cy, get up. I rushed all around the hotel like a banshee, <laughs> banging on every single door, and then I went and made an enormous pot of tea. There was nobody in the hotel kitchen, it was 20 to 5, and, and then, then it started. But there was a benefit. There was a benefit. Because the weather was so bad, they rehearsed. They rehearsed all the battle scenes, and that was choreography. So that the Zulus knew what they were doing, our lot knew what we were doing, and they made up those two weeks within the first month of filming. It just went like clockwork from that moment onwards. We used to take the Zulus off, away from the main unit, and rehearse the scenes that, that, that there was next to be shot. The idea being that if we could, if the, direct, the director would tell us what he wanted, we go away and rehearse it. So when it came back, it, it saved a lot of time. Instead of rehearsing in front of camera, it was rehearsed away from camera, come back and they could shoot it and it speeded the whole thing up. The dance sequence was really because by that time, Garsha booed lazy with her. So he was playing catch a whale. So Bart Garsha and his uh, advisors, they really set up the dance sequence as it would be for Sai to direct as a cam as a director. But they were the one who advised him on what they did and what they didn't do. Lazy, of course, was a highly intelligent man. His mother was the paramount chief, but Butalese had been educated in England. He went to Sandhurst, so uh, he was very familiar with, with English ways and society, and highly intelligent man who spoke perfect English, and it was wonderful to deal with. He's in the film, of course. He plays Chetawea in the film and very dignified family and yes we were we they they were treated differently by the government very specially so stanley became enormous friends of Butalese. and when stanley died i had a magnificent wreath and a letter and he actually said he was the finest white man he'd ever met i don't know if anybody's told you they'd never seen a movie they didn't recognize what a camera was and this was incredibly difficult, rehearsing them, because they didn't know what they were rehearsing to, this strange machine. So it was Stanley who had the idea, and it was wonderful. They sent down to Johannesburg for silent movies. Harold Lloyd, uh, Laurel and Hardy, and um, who else? Buster Keaton, who they adored. A rock was painted white, and every night we had a film show. Well, we all went to it, and their delight, and they were highly intelligent. They knew exactly then what they had to do. So Stanley and I went up there with a couple of muskets, Marti, Henry Martini rifles with blanks, and I would go out in front 
pretending to be a Zulu with a spear and a shield, which of course is the Zulu's love because I obviously didn't hold it properly or do anything properly with it. And as I advanced on Stanley, Stanley would shoot me with a blank and I would go over in a stuntman's death fall that you've seen a million times. And the trick was to stop them acting to camera. I don't know, in the film, they throw themselves and the spears go in them and they lurch down from trees. <laughs> you have to say, stop overacting. They were, they were amazing. We didn't actually have as many Zulus as we wanted. We shot the whole film with about 500 Zulus. And this was a problem. When we were doing the scenes with the Zulu impies coming over the hills, we didn't have no Zulus. So our prop man, I had a brilliant idea. He took a batten of wood and nailed ten shields on this batten and put plumes over the top. And then we put a live Zulu at each end. So for every two Zulus, we had 12. But if you look really, really hard, you can see that ten of them haven't got any legs. When we had to do the fight sequences and everything, well, of course, you staging fights you are very much in each other's hands as it were because their assegais were real and all those firearms were real and the bayonets there was no fake rubber bayonets or anything like that so we all had to work it out pretty carefully that nobody actually got seriously hurt and to the best of my knowledge nobody was seriously hurt a few scratches and bruises and things <laughs> There weren't any really main stunts, as I call stunts. The point was that it was all action scenes, all fight scenes, really, and not individual stunts. Bodies would be falling. Get shot or speared in the action. They were all wonderfully drilled, wonderfully drilled. As I was wounded fairly early on, I, in the battle sequences, I, in fact, I was shot. And so, in fact, apart from doing my heroic bit, which I did, which I got the VC for, which was carrying around the ammunition whilst wounded, I didn't actually have to do any cut and thrust of uh, fighting, but just drag this ammunition box around, which was not too arduous, really. <laughs> my costume consisted of a bandage with this great puddle of blood in the middle of it and they keep rushing in and refreshing. It wasn't a very comfortable costume, actually, but there you go. And also that was the other talking about costumes too, there was a lot of very serious wounds in the, and of course once these wounds are done, like acid guys sticking in chests and half a hope slush to it, the artist had to keep these on. So you put you off your lunch, you know. You, you'll be sitting down there with somebody with an eye dropping out and somebody else and that's the guy sticking in. Oh, and well, I have a double leg and chips, <laughs> Yeah! Hot. <laughs> no, um... That, and everybody knows that movies are phony. Um, what they do, they get some gel, petroleum jelly, on a brush, and they paint everything with petroleum jelly. And then they set fire to it, and it all flares up, and they get some smoke, and they pump it in, and they say, run through that. Mind you, you don't get your ass burned. And, uh, you know, it looks good. The problem, of course, was with the Zulus, who are almost naked. And we also had feathers round here and things. It was fun when your boys playing as soldiers. Johnny Gibson really deserves marvellous uh, applause, really, for his, the way he cut the picture. Because I, he would work with me as a, a second unit director. And if he was short of a cut to get into something or whatever, he would take me in the cutting room, show me where was something was missing, and ask me if I'd go out and do something that would actually cut into that sequence to keep the rhythm going. When you see all the disjointed bits that he had to turn into charges, fights, I think they're actually the battle sequences, and the advance and fire was part of the success of the movie, I think.
Secretary of State for War has today received the following dispatch from Lord Chelmsford, Commander-in-Chief of Her Majesty's Forces in Natal Colony, South Africa. When the film was finished and it was being put together, and we were enormously proud of it, I think everybody knew by then there was something very, very special. And um, Stanley showed it to Richard, who was staying at the Dorchester at the time, and asked him if he would do the narration, and there was no problem at all. Richard came down to Twickenham and did it in an afternoon. I regret to report a very disastrous engagement which took place on the morning of the 22nd January between the armies of the Zulu King, Quechua, and our own number three column, consisting of five companies of the 1st Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, and one company of the 2nd Battalion, a total of nearly 1,500 men, officers, and other ranks. The Zulus, in overwhelming numbers, launched a highly disciplined attack on the slopes of the mountain of Visandlwana, and in spite of gallant resistance, the column was completely annihilated. <laughs> I love John Barry's music for Zulu. I think that those opening sounds are absolutely wonderful. And when John does come to London and does his music at the Albert Hall, I have been a few times, and the audience really do respond to the themes of, of Zulu. They love it, they, they cheer. John Barry listened to all this Zulu music, and uh, the theme of Zulu came out of those, uh, uh, of the original, indigenous Zulu music. And in fact, the, the music of Zulu, I think nearly earned as much money as the film because it was a tremendous success. The film was at the Plaza and the premiere was as ever at the Grosvenor House. Everybody goes to the Grosvenor House to have their film premiere in those days. And John Barry had composed the Zulu stamp. I remember Ivory Manuel singing. And uh, what else? Uh, um, I remember drinking a lot of champagne and having a great party. And what a big success it was. Unbelievable success. I mean, you couldn't believe. Uh, right the f I think in the first two or three weeks, we were practically home and dry from the point of view of the cost of the picture. Um, and uh, we were at the time the biggest box office take that England had ever, ever had. We were on Cloud Nine. This was Stanley's first production. There were two other films that were taking a lot of money in January. Hard Day's Night with the Beatles and a Bond film. And every night we went to the plaza to look at the queues, every single night. It was a very thrilling time. He took some of us to see the film, and in a deprecating manner, he, at intervals, said to me, the scriptwriter should have made that, more of that scene, and the scriptwriter should have cut that bit of dialogue, and the scriptwriter should have done this, that, and the next thing. And eventually, a man sitting behind him tapped him on the shoulder and said, if you think you could write a script like this, laddie, you should try. Stanley was an incredibly fit person. I mean, he really was very physical, uh, he loved sports and everything. And there didn't appear to be any deterioration, but there was. And it was in 1974 that I noticed, and he was only, what, then, 45, that he was slowing up. And I just thought, well, he's packed in an awful lot into his life. He's only 45, he's made 87 films. It's been a hard life, and we didn't take any notice. And one, he missed a Wales England International. I went instead to Twickenham and I thought he really must be ill to be watching this. That was January the 17th. He was operated on a few days later. It was just there, it was cancer of the lung that had spread and he died after 20 weeks.
is a classic film and has become more so, I mean, what is it now, nearly 40 years? People like it. I mean, you're wandering around the streets, oh, Zulu's on tonight, oh, I can't come down the pub. People still re re remember me from there. They even actually recognise me, which I find strange. People have a great love of Zulu. I've been all over the world and people have come up to me and said, it's my favourite film. To some blokes, it is a, almost a way of life. I've never worked it out, but it works. This is a film that works. And, of course, being a period film in costume, it won't date. One of those films that will go on and on and on. I get letters from all over the world. There are clubs in America, clubs in, in Canada. Uh, I get rec I've given every bit of memorabilia I've ever had, and I did have a lot of memorabilia. It's all gone. My grandchildren, when they see it, they think that I, they think that my eldest son, Matthew, is, is, they say there's Uncle Matthew. They don't realise it's old grandpa. He always uh, used to say that he thought he'd bored more people at Christmas time than anyone else alive because it was always being shown at uh, Christmas. I've seen the film hundreds of times and I always think, I'll watch it for ten minutes and then you get right through to the end. It's a miracle. If it's a miracle, Colour Sergeant, it's a short chamber boxer Henry .45 calibre miracle. And a bayonet, sir. With some guts behind it. At the end in the last scene in the film, for me and for everybody else, I think, summed up the awfulness of war in any any description, in any situation. Does everyone feel like this afterwards? How do you feel? Sick. This picture was made without any bias towards the black or the white. There is no razzmatazz and waving of the band with the British. I feel ashamed. Was that how it was for you? The first time? First time? I think I could stand this butcher's yard more than once. It wasn't a question of who was brave and who wasn't brave. They're both sides were exactly the same. Oh, my God. Even to stand there, even if you have got rifles and they've got spears, just to actually stand there in the face of that mass is a feat of incredible, incredible courage. They're saluting you. <laughs> <laughs> They're saluting fellow braves. Ah!